started over 100 women during birth um, and labor, um, and has also trained other women in the careers of birth and postpartum doulas. Um, so today we'll get to hear from her and learn from her experience. I'm so excited. I've actually seen her in the hospital before, <laughs> serving a woman um, with Torah, which was nice. Um, so if y'all can help me give her a hand and welcome her to the stage. Hi, I'm glad to see all of you here. Um, I'm always impressed that, not even impressed isn't the right word, I'm amazed that someone would ask me to come and talk to people because I saw the list of your speakers and I'm like, how do I get on that list? <laughs> but anyway, um, I am a doula. I've been a doula for almost 30 years and it's probably closer to a thousand babies in a hundred, so um, between all the postpartum and the birth. And um, I know that the, the title is um, Doulas and Reproductive Justice and I guess I'm not sure where to start. Um, do, does everybody here know what a doula is? Should we start with that, or is that? Yeah. We all know what that is. We have to go through that. <laughs> anybody not know what a doula is? Can we go through it? Oh, we're going to go through it. Okay. <laughs> we have a lot of students here who might have heard the term. Okay. Not familiar with the exactly. Okay. Well, the term doula was coined um, in 1969 by an anthropologist that used to work with Margaret Mead named Dana Raphael, <coughs> and she um, termed this phrase, which means a woman's servant. We've cleaned it up a little bit and call it now mother's helper, but basically that's what it is. It's a Greek word that means um, woman's servant. And a doula is someone who does emotional support for a laboring birth person. We don't do anything medical. Uh, we may know some medical things after a while, but we're, we're not, that's not in our scope of practice. Um, we're there mainly to educate and to um, support the person giving birth. There are several kinds of doulas. There's uh, the birth doula, which accompanies people in labor. There's a postpartum doula who helps them figure out what they brought home and what to do with it. Um, and there's um, doulas that call herself full spectrum. <clears throat> which work with birth and abortion and death and postpartum. So it's a, they, they do it all. Um, and the, the death doulas are um, people who kind of escort people out as the birth doulas escort people in. So um, they work in hospice and work with the families around people who are um, terminally ill. Hi. Um, let's see where to go from there. Um, as far as the birth justice part, uh, I feel that, that that is now in a place where I was hoping it would get when I first became a doula. Um, one of my dreams was to help train women of color be doulas for other women of color. And mainly because when I started out, you could count the women of color doulas on half of one hand, probably. And um, it stereotypically was either a, a younger or older white person that was kind of hippie-like or new agey or they had potions and feathers and stuff. Um, <laughs> and that's kind of how people saw them. Um, but the doctors saw them a little differently. They saw them as someone who was going to come in and get in the way of what they were trying to get the birthing person to do and to um, alter what they wanted to have happen. So there, there have been times when hospitals or doctors' practices have banned their clients from having doulas with them because they don't want to work with them. Um, I think that's changed a little bit over time because they've seen more and more doulas work. Um, but back to the women of color part, um, I always felt that it was really important for someone to have a person of color, if they're a person of color with them, for several reasons. Um, one, because I feel like they could be more comfortable in their laboring. Um, they'd be with someone who understands who they are, and looks like them, knows their culture, um, is not afraid of them or their family. And 
I always cite the example that, yes, a young white woman could probably help anybody of color giving birth, but sometimes they are afraid because back in the day when you could have 85 people in the birthing room with you, there would inevitably be crazy Uncle Joe. I don't know why he was there, but she wanted him at the birth. And um, if you didn't know crazy Uncle Joe, you'd be probably right to be afraid of him. But if you're black, you know that crazy Uncle Joe, because we all have one, it's probably not anything to be worried about. He's just Uncle Joe. So, <laughs> so if you know that that's going on, you, you can still help the person and still deal with Uncle Joe, too, and not be afraid of him. Um, the second part of that is I feel like <clears throat> The dual profession is a really amazing career to have. Um, I can't think of one that's better because you get to see new life come into the world. Um, sometimes it's hard because of what birth looks like in America today, but it's still, to me, every time a miracle that these little people come out of that cavity. <laughs> and most of them come here with all their parts in the right place. Um, so it's a pretty cool way to make a living. And it's also um, great to help families get started on the other side. Because I say that postpartum is kind of a club you can't get into until you're in it. Basically, no one talks to you about postpartum before you're there. Um, not quite sure that is, except maybe they're too afraid to tell you what you're going to happen, happen to you. But um, if you see someone doing this job, or let's back up. If you see a young white girl doing this job and you think to yourself, wow, that was really cool. She helped me get through my labor better than I thought I could. I wish I could do that job. And if you only see white people doing the job, you assume that that's a job for white people. But if you see someone who looks like you doing that job, then you can pursue how to go about doing that yourself. And, and being a doula can lift you out of um, a situation where you might be in poverty and move you into a place where you can make a fairly good living. Um, it seems that people have finally gotten on the bandwagon around that, that having someone who looks like the person giving birth may save them from the hospital killing them. <laughs> um, and I say that because black women statistically in California died more than, or four times more than anybody else giving birth, which I, it's just hard for me to believe. And in, in New York, it it's, was up to 12 times more. And that's now. That's not like in the 50s. That's now. And that has to stop. And if having someone who looks like you attend your birth can get you out of there alive, then I'm all for it. Um, I'm not quite sure of the way they're going about it, but I think it needs to be looked at and, um, and make that happen. And it also can't be volunteer. It has to be a paid position. Um, I don't believe that black women should volunteer and not get paid to serve a community that we are definitely impacting and helping. We need to get paid for that. Um, I do this best by answering questions. <laughs> So if anybody has questions, I'd be glad to just answer away. Don't be shocked. Maybe you could, you could tell us how did you get did How did you get to become a doula? That's a good story. Um, in my past life, I'm, I'm a lot older than I appear to be. So in my past life, I was a corporate Xerox executive. Hard to tell by looking at me right now. <laughs> but that was, what, that was what I did. And that's how I raised my first daughter, who is now 53. Um, when she was 21, I had been sailing for three years. And I got back from sailing and realized that I was pregnant. Well, I thought I was pregnant. I was hoping I wasn't, but I was. I was praying for a tumor. Because <laughs> I did not want to do this all over again. But. Um, I, I was in heavy denial, and I wouldn't even go to a doctor. I was passing a Planned Parenthood one day after I started back work again, and I said, okay, I'm going to just bite the bullet, go in, pee in the bottle, and they're going to tell me that it's just stress. 
but they didn't. They told me I was pregnant. So I was like, ugh, I can't do this again. I raised my daughter by myself the first time, and it was hard. And I knew I would be, tr would be raising this one alone because I didn't like her father, and I had plans on leaving him so shortly. <clears throat> so I said, okay, well, that's interesting news, but how, how soon can I get an abortion? And they said, well, is that really what you want to do? And I said, yeah, it is. I can't, my daughter's 21. I can't do this yet. Um, so they said, okay, and they said a date. But the person that was inside me said, that's not going to happen. So she, she, I had the most horrendous nightmares that I've ever had in my life for about two weeks until I was laying there. I woke up and I, I just said, okay, okay, you win. You get to come. And then they stopped. And so she's still pretty much the same today <laughs> at 32. But um, uh, the reason I tell that story is I, I say that's the only reason I can understand that the universe would do that to me because it led me to be a doula. Because um, the way I found out about what doulas were was I had gone back to work and she was about four or five. And um, I got laid off and I was going to these interviews and I was sitting across the desk from these people and I was just like, ugh. I can't do this for the rest of my life, I'll kill myself. So I was talking to this woman who I've become friend with that I met in my childbirth class. And she said, well, I hear you. She said, but, well, let me think about it. And she said, well, I have this friend in New York, and she does something, it begins with a D, I can never remember the word, but she works with pregnant women and babies. And she told me this because she knew that newborns are pretty much my favorite age of human. And the joke around me is after they get to be a year, I'm pretty much done with them. <laughs> I like them new and fresh and right out of the package where you can just cuddle. They don't, you don't have to feed them and talk to them and interact with them or chase them around. Um, so I called her friend in New York. And at the time, doulas were much more um, prevalent than they were on the West Coast. And she worked for an agency and she, worked, she did postpartum doula work. So I talked to her on the phone for about two hours, and I hung up the phone, and I had an Oprah aha moment, and, and, and uh, I said, huh, I can make a living just hanging out with babies for the rest of my life. <laughs> Sounds good to me. So I was in marketing and sales at Xerox, so I used all the crap I learned there to market their boxes and use it on me, and it worked. So from the time I decided to be a doula until today, I've done nothing else except be a birth and postpartum doula. So that's how I got into this. <laughs> this <story. laughs> and it's a job I absolutely love. And I, I think you kind of have to love it to do it because uh, it's a hard job. It's hard. Um, it's very rewarding, but it's hard. Um, the birth part's hard because you have to watch birth in America, which is a tough thing to do sometimes, unless you can keep them home to the very last minute and then run them in there and they just have to catch the baby and we go home. But if it's a long drawn out thing, it, it's so traumatic for women that um, it's hard to watch sometimes. Sometimes I leave and sit in my car and cry because I just go, oh my God. I just watched basically a gang rape in there and I could do nothing about it. And then I think to myself, well, yeah, that's what it looked like if you were there. Imagine if you weren't. So that keeps me going back to the next one. Um, and the postpartum side is hard because you're dealing with um, hormonally depleted, um, emotional people who just given birth and all that surrounds them. Um, and you have to be able to walk that line and keep everybody where they need to be and, and listen to, to the birthing person and hear a story and let her process what happened to her and tell her it's okay, you know, and help her uh, somehow spiritually and ceremoniously heal what she's just gone through. So, um, and then the, the night postpartum, which is what I mostly do, um, I'm fairly no, well known around here for doing night postpartum work with multiples, so twins, triplets. So I don't get a lot of sleep, so, but that's what I've been doing for this long, so I don't need much sleep, and it works out okay, but I, and I love doing that. Um, but it's a, it's a hard job, and, you, and your life belongs to people who are giving birth. Like, as I speak, 
I have someone in the hospital being induced. I called Dominic this morning and said, I don't know if I'm going to be able to be there because I don't know where she'll be. But she's just getting started with an induction, so that'll be a while. So um, I'm okay with being here. But the way I do this work is that I, I consider myself always on call, always, because babies come when babies come, not on that date that someone pulled out of their hiney and gave to them. Um, so. I just go about my life doing whatever I do until the phone rings and then everybody in my life knows that if the phone rings, whatever we plan to do, I'm not going to do because babies come first. So, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. So, if you're okay with it, I was wondering when you start working with a parent and then what that looks like, how often you meet with them, what that process mm -hmm. looks like, and then when you typically end with that family. Yes. Um, most of the time, people, if they know they're going to have a doula, if they, they're, they, they have the wherewithal to know where a doula is and know that they want one, they usually contact me beginning of third trimester, somewhere around there. I've had people who I've been with before who call, I think I'm the first one they tell is pregnant. <laughs> they say, are you, are you available? Because if not, I may not have this baby. <laughs> so, um, so there's those people. And then there's also people who, you know, they, they went along listening to what everybody tells them about how you don't need to have anybody with you. You can just go in with your partner and everything will be fine. And then they realized, yeah, that I don't think I've been to the hospital tour and I've been to the class, and I'm not sure that this person's going to be able to handle this program. So then they call me like two weeks before their due date and say, you know, are you available? Um, but typically they, they contact me enough time that we can have at least two prenatal visits where the first one I talk to them about, well, I listen to them tell me what their perfect birth would be. And then I tell them what it probably will be. And then we work on a plan to try to get as close to that as possible. Because I, I believe that they should have a one piece of paper that says, this is who we are, this is what I'd like to do and what I'd like, not like to do, to hand to the nurse and triage when they get there. Because they, they can't have that conversation and that they're having contractions every two minutes apart. So um, I, I believe that it's important for the hospital to know that they have something in mind of what they want. It helps them put them with a nurse that might be able to go along with what they're trying to do um, versus someone who maybe wants to try to do this without medication, but they have a, a nurse that thinks she's crazy to do that and keeps asking her <laughs> when she's going to have an epidural. Um, and then the second meeting is I, I want to know what they're worried about, what they're afraid of, what they're anxious about, what they're scared about any bad things that have happened to her that may impact her birthing experience. Um, so that's everything from, um, you know, what the baby's going to look like. I had one mom, she was, both, both of them were very attractive, and she said, you know, I, I'm not worried about the birth, I'm not worried about the labor, but I'm worried about what my baby's going to look like. And I'm like, why would you worry about what your baby's going to look like? She said, well, because I keep having this dream about my baby. And I said, well, what's the dream? And she said, well, it's covered with fur, hair, like pubic hair, and it's got like a leg coming out of its back. And I'm like, mm, okay, well, now we've got that out of the air. So let me just say that that could happen, but I'm 99.99% sure it won't, So, but I'm glad you told me because I, I tell them that the pregnant brain is a really bad neighborhood to walk around in by itself because it's just, we're just insane for nine months. And so if she hadn't said that, or I didn't know that she had that thought in her head, then um, she would let her baby out. She wouldn't give birth to that baby. She wouldn't push that baby out because she'd be afraid of what it's going to look like. Sorry, I'm going to turn my phone off too. Um, um, another one um, was uh, a dad who said, well, I guess I should tell you this. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, well, six months ago, my brother and his wife had a baby, and it died at birth. I'm like, well, yeah, that's, that's probably going to be in the room with us. It's a big old elephant. And I said, well, do you know what happened? And he said, well, it's be they said it's because there's a cord around it. There was a cord around the neck. Mm -hmm. Which I think if you 
ask most people when the baby dies, that's the first thing you usually hear. I'm so sure that you're dead. I'm like, yeah, well, see, I told you real um, And then there's a, then there it gets to the, the sublime, which is like, okay, I don't care anything about the labor, the birth, any of that stuff. I just need you to help me deal with my mom. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes all the prenatals are about the what to do with mom. And I go, so we're going to be okay. Mom's going to be okay. But so it's that kind of thing. It's just anything that they're worried about, what they're concerned about, what they're anxious or scared about. Because fear is the thing that really puts a damper on labor. You can't labor well if you're afraid. So it helps to, um, to get that out of the air. And then um, from the second appointment, the second meeting we have until they go into um, labor, you know, I'm just available for them to call if they need to answer any questions or this is happening, should I call a doctor or is this labor or is this not or whatever. And they can do that from the time they hire me, but it's, it usually happens more between that last visit and going into labor. And then when they do go into labor, I have them call me on the second one after their partner, or if there's no partner on the first one, to know that they're in labor. And then we talk about what's going on on the phone. <clears throat> and usually labor starts right around now, you know, <laughs> six, seven, eight o'clock in the evening when everybody's in the place they're supposed to be and nobody's at work and nobody's across the bridge and everybody's where they're supposed to be. <clears throat> and they usually call me around nine and say, well, you know, I've been having this feeling since six or seven. And that's how I usually tell them to do something to go to sleep. I don't want them to be up all night counting subtractions that are 20, 25 minutes apart. They need to get some sleep. So I say, you know that wine you haven't been able to eat, drink for nine months? Now you can have it and go to sleep. <laughs> um, or take a banjo or have warm milk or something. I said, not all of those, just one of, pick one. And then if they, if they do go to sleep and they sleep all night, I just assume that I haven't heard from them so they're asleep. But if labor kicks up in the middle of the night, then they call me back. And we still continue to talk on the phone for a while until I determine or they determine that they want me to be there with them. Um, I usually leave it up to them because I tell them that this is the last time they're going to be alone for a very long time. And they might want to take advantage of that last time of being alone together <laughs> um, with no one knocking on the door. So um, when they decide that they want me to come or if I call them it sounds like I need to come, then I go to their house and see what's going on. Usually with first babies, we have more time. And a lot of times they'll call me and they'll say, oh, the contractions are like two or three minutes apart and you know, they're really strong. And I say, okay, I'm coming. And I get there and then it all stops because now she's not afraid anymore. And so the contractions go away. So then we watch a movie or play games or whatever until the labor kicks up again. And we do some things to try to make it get going again. Um, but the way I do my business is that, and from, I've always done it from the beginning, is that once they get me there, I'm with them until that baby's born, whether that's three hours or some, the longest I think was eight days. Whatever that is, I'm with them the whole time. I don't believe in leaving them and taking a break or going home and then come back when things get better. Because what happens in labor, I think, um, I need to know what's happening to the whole labor. Because if I leave and she has a nervous breakdown while I'm gone, she's not going to tell me. And that, that factors into what's going on. So I need to be able to see that. So I tell them when they hire me that they better like the way I look and sound because we may be together for a very long time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that's that. And then I'm with them through the labor and delivery. I usually hang out for a couple hours afterwards to make sure that everybody's still alive and that the baby's latched on and she's not passing out on the floor and everybody's good. I usually don't hang out until they move to the next place. Some of them I do, but most of them I don't because I'm tired. I need to go home. <laughs> and um, then I leave. I tend to not see them in the hospital because I like them to come home as soon as possible. <clears throat> but I see them as soon as they get home, either the same day if it's a timely time or the next day so that I can see how the baby's nursing, see how she's doing, um, all that, the whole dynamics of it. And then um, if nursing's going well, everything's fine, I can tell if the baby's eating well. 
Um, then I usually see them in about another week after they've had their product home for a week. And then I go in and give like a little baby 101 streamline class <laughs> of what they should stop doing and what they might want to do <laughs> to make this a little better. Excuse me. Um, if they're having troubles with nursing, then I, I tend to keep coming until we get that handled. And I, I, keep in, I keep in touch with them for at least up to six weeks. I'll text them or call them and see how they're doing and make sure they're okay. Some of them stay a little longer and call me when the kid's going to preschool to ask which preschool they should put them in. <laughs> I go, that's out of my thing. But, but I do get called. I tell them I'm good for up to about six, eight months of the night. Kind of lose interest in the whole process. <laughs> They're on their own then. <laughs> but I answer a lot of, you know, teasing questions and all that stuff that comes up between birth and middle year. And most doulas have some version of that that they do. Yeah. How do you engage like partners in the birth process? Um, I tell them that we are a team, and we are. Uh, I tell them that I don't come in and swoop in as super doula and push them aside because I tell them now I don't do it because I'm old and I have to pace myself for when they really need me. I will be here, but I, I'm not gonna. I don't. I'm not the kind of doula who's just all over someone. I don't believe that. Personally, I don't believe that uh, a birthing person needs to have people all over them to give birth. I think that they know how to give birth. They just need to have guidance, and so I'm there to guide them. Um, and that looks like, you know, when they get themselves into this position like this. And they go, this is the best one. I'm like, yeah, no, it's not. You have to move. <laughs> so I can get, and I can get them to move, and their partner can't because they don't listen to the partner at that point. Um, um, and I, I, I tell them that I want, in a perfect world, it would be just the two of them going in to do this, like on TV. It ain't a perfect world, and you don't want to go in there alone. So you have to bring in someone like me to guide them. And I tell them that. You know, many people could go and climb the Himalayas by themselves, but having a Sherpa sometimes helps a little bit. And so I'm their Sherpa to birth, this birth experience. And so they get, they get behind that and understand it. And um, so I tell them that I, I'm there to keep them together as long as possible. I said, but my work at, will start and yours will probably end when she goes, don't touch me! <laughs> she, he hears, don't touch her forever, but what she means is stop doing this. You know, because when they get nervous, this is how partners tend to rub people, and that's not good in labor. <laughs> you don't want to do that. So I will either try to show them, you know, a better way of doing what they're doing to try to keep them there together longer, or just sometimes it gets to a place where labor is starting to get very intense. It's seven, eight centimeters, and you know, whoever's giving birth has decided that this is really a bad idea, <laughs> and someone else needs to take over now because it's now been 40 hours, and they're tired, and they really don't want to have drugs, but they're looking really good right about now. And so that's when my work starts. My work starts then to help them figure out that, remember in the living room you told me you didn't want to have anything, and you wanted to have this, whatever you wanted to have. So let's try to kill, still stay on that. But it's not my birth, it's, it's their birth. So if she gets to a place where it's like, I'm done with this, that's up to her. I will tell her that if I think that she's like eight or nine centimeters, that maybe let's get checked and see if we just have a little bit more to go. But if, I've been with people who get epidurals at 10 centimeters. That's on them, you know, that's what they needed to do. That's what they do. My job is not to throw myself over her perineum and stop her from doing things. That's not that's not my job. My job is to support her decisions in this birth and help her get through it. Um, the partners are afraid. They're really afraid because if you've never seen birth before, it doesn't look pretty. It's like, and I tell them, I said, if I walked up to somebody on the side of the road that was going through this, I'd be the first one on the phone at 911 and tell them to bring everything they got because this does not look good. <laughs> I said, but you have to understand that as dual as a midwife, we see those things that we're like, 
yeah, you know, because she'd know. You know, when she's crawling around the floor throwing up, we're going, yes! <laughs> you know? And he's looking at me like I'm insane. But I tell them that that means that they're probably about to have their baby. But I had, you know, they, they need to have someone that they can look to and know that their partner is okay. Or have someone tell them that because they've seen what's this over and over and over and over again and they know what the hospital is looking for and looking at, can tell them if things are going to shift and it's not going to be low lights and music anymore. Mm -hmm. Then in 10 minutes the door is going to come open and six people are coming in here and this is what they're going to say. Um, I had the, the most momentous one as a, a dad. I had one time and at the postpartum visit he said, I just need to tell you this one whole thing. I said, okay, what? Right, were you unhappy with something? He said, oh, no, 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 contrary to that. He said, I was, I was watching my partner in labor. And he said, I just knew she was going to die. I, I knew that no one could look like she was living <laughs> and still live. And I was standing there trying to be supportive, but I was formulating a phone call in my head where I had to call her parents and tell her that I had let her, their daughter die. <laughs> and he said, but then I looked it over at you, and you didn't seem to think that anything was wrong. So I thought, okay, Linda said she would tell us if they were going to die. So I'm going, okay, she's not saying anything, so she must be going to be okay, you know. And then he was okay after that, and he, was, he reassured himself. He, all this was going on, I had no idea until afterwards. But, um, but that's what happens. They really think that it's a, a kind of a deadly thing that's going to happen. They, they don't know that they're both going to come out of their life. He, he sees himself as, at the worst case, going home to raise his child by himself, you know, with a dead partner, or, they, or they're both going to die. You know? So, I had one dad who um, was with his wife, she was trying to have a feedback, and she ruptured, her uterus ruptured, and she got Linda, twisted off. you probably should explain feedback. Oh, feedback is someone who had a C-section with their first baby, or earlier baby, and now is trying to have a baby to the vagina, mm. the good old-fashioned way. Um, so she ruptured, which means her, her uterus tore while she was trying to push her baby out, and they whisked her away, and everybody was fine. But at the, again, at the postpartum visit, she said, you know, I, I know they probably won't let me, but I, you know, do you think they would, you think I could try the third time? He goes, uh, excuse me? <laughs> I know how you get these babies, and if you plan on doing this again, you better call Linda to get you pregnant, because I am not doing this again. <laughs> I am not going to be standing outside that operating door crying anymore. I'm not going to do it. So it's, it's very hard on the partner to watch their person in labor. It's just, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to ask for. I like them being there because they get to see how powerful people that are pushing babies out of their body look. It's, it's, they, they have a whole new outlook on who they married or who they're partnered with for at least six weeks <laughs> afterwards because they're like, there ain't no way that I could ever do that. Just, that's just, she's a wonder person. I don't know how they did that. So, um, so when I work with partners, it's, it's a team effect. You know, I, I've never once ever had a partner say, I wish you weren't there. Mm -hmm. They're usually like, buying me wine and <laughs> offering to pay my rent. <laughs> so. Anything else? Yes? You had mentioned earlier about um, being in the birthing room and it being like watching the game. Mm -hmm. And I've been reading a lot around uh, just how the medical industry is not looking for women when they're giving birth. And I'm wondering if you have an example where you did not actually witness something traumatic, at least in, mm -hmm. engaging with somebody. That I did not. Yeah, I did. Oh, it happens a lot. Oh. It's not, they're not all horrible. <laughs> Some of them are, are beautiful, you know. And um, but those are the ones who who go into labor on their own. They're not talked into an induction. They go into labor. We labor at home for a long time. We go into the hospital because that's the place they chose to have their baby, and we're there for a half hour, and she pushes out her baby. And the doctors are. Yeah, it, it, then it's a different game. Then it becomes like, <laughs> I, I never, I don't know, maybe you can speak to why this happens, but 
I can never, I've never understood why when, when you present with this, this woman and she's nine or ten, seven years, she still has probably hours to push out her baby, but everybody goes insane. You know, it's like 16 nurses in the room doing whatever it is they're doing, and, and she's like, I thought I was just going to push my baby. I said, I know, but they got to do this. They don't have the tray ready yet, you know? <laughs> so, um, so it becomes kind of it, a little bit of a circus for a while, but, um, and I just, I, I keep going, why is it like, this is not, we're not like at CVS, this is not, this is labor delivery. <laughs> this is like such a big deal that she's about ready to have a baby, but it is what it is. But I've been at many births that were, were just, I cry because they're so beautiful, you know. And I always say to them, but they don't know, they don't know that their birth was beautiful. They, they don't understand that they had this amazing, should have been filmed for everybody to see birth. And I go, go and tell everybody about your birth. And they're like, why? <laughs> because, because people only hear the horrible stories. When you're pregnant, People can't wait to tell you how they were in labor for 75 hours and had a C-section. You know, those are the stories that everybody hears. Nobody hears about the most amazing, incredible birth because they don't really know. The ones who do know that are the ones that chose to not go back to the hospital for a subsequent birth. They decided to do a home birth. And then they tell everybody how wonderful and what the comparison was like from having their baby in their bedroom to having a baby at the hospital. Those are the ones that spread the word. But, um, people that have wonderful births in the hospital very seldom tell people because they don't realize it's been that great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you do a home birth, are you working with a midwife or is it just you and a family? Preferably with a midwife. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I haven't done that many over the years, mainly because midwives carry their home, the whole own little entourage of women with them, someone who's, you know, usually a couple of people who are training possibly, and then whenever there's a birth, when the birth happens, there's always two midwives there, or more, to, to be at the birth, it's not just one. Um, this past summer though, <laughs> after 30 years almost, I had to catch two by myself within three weeks of each other, and I'm like, okay, this is not what we're supposed to be doing here, but <laughs> they fooled me and I didn't. They, did, they didn't ask the right questions, and the next thing I knew, there was a baby coming out. Like, okay, well, here we go. So, so in that case, I you know had the partner call nine one one, and they're always so cute. They always call nine one one, and and I'm standing here with you know with the baby's head basically in my hands, and they're like, um, yeah, I'm calling because my wife's in labor. I'm like, no, tell them your baby, <laughs> your wife's pushing out a baby. <laughs> so anyway, then the paramedics come and. They're all like 12 and don't know what to do. But. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, well, I've been doing this for 30 years. They go, okay, well, just tell us what to do. So, so. That's happened about three or four times. But, um, yeah. yeah. But catching it all by myself has only happened twice. And everything is fine. Can you uh, explain the difference between a doula and a midwife? And also, can you say one of the most common questions that you get asked? Okay. The most common question is, what is a doula? Because <laughs> I can't believe it, but a lot of people don't. Even people in the medical field, I just don't understand how people in the medical field don't know what a doula is, but they don't. Um, <clears throat> the difference between a doula and a midwife is that a midwife is uh, very much like an obstetrician. They are responsible for the person's health and welfare during their pregnancy and they catch the baby, and they do any kind of repairs that would happen during the birth. And then they follow them very, very, more unlike a doctor, they follow them very, very closely after they have their baby, you know, after six weeks. <coughs> yes? I shouldn't say that. There, there are very few insurance companies that will do it. Um, not a lot. Mostly the answer is no. Insurance doesn't pick it up. Um, I get paid um, because I work with people who can afford to pay me for the most part. Um, if those that are working in community who are working with people who can't get paid, 
then they're either, they're either do it volunteer or they're getting paid through a grant or a personal funds that have been raised, that kind of thing. They can give more Medicaid. I, I don't believe a, a midwife who is not a certified nurse midwife can give um, as many medications. As many medications, but they but they also but they do carry like these are people who who do only home births. Yeah. They they do carry oxygen. They, you know they they probably have the toast in case there's bleeding afterwards. They they do have some basic things, but it's not like um, a midwife that works in a hospital. It was also going to be like around compensation and stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if like for rates, that's something that is like, is it ever like some kind of a flat base for a rate and then additional or some kind of like, I work it out individually with like, or like case by case or something, or just what your experience with like, in like your whole I'm not sure I understand the question. Sorry, um, I'm just kind of like, what does like compensation or rates look like? Uh -huh. Is it like a case by case, or is there some kind of like a flat like base? Uh, okay, I hear you say. Um, personally, I have a flat rate. I give a discount to people who I've been with more than once, mm -hmm. um, and I also do pro bono births just mm -hmm. because I want to give back. If somebody can't afford it, then I just do the birth for them. Mm -hmm. um, some people use a sliding scale mm -hmm. so that you can. Get pay what you can between this and this. Um, yeah. Thank you. Somebody back there, Andrew. Yeah. I wonder what the biggest challenge is you see others having postpartum. How do you walk them through what those are? I think the biggest one is isolation. Um, we don't, we keep our, our people really kind of isolated after the first couple weeks. <clears throat> first couple weeks there's usually some in-laws or grandparents or the partners home from work. And then come week three, and they're pretty much on their own with this little thing that they haven't quite figured out yet. Um, baby doesn't know how to feed all the way. She's sore because she's probably had a C-section. Um, and it's hard to be with a, a baby that's crying all by yourself when you're sleep deprived. It's, it's uh, it's a lot to ask, you know. Um, this isn't something we're supposed to do all by ourselves, but a lot of time we do. And uh, our country doesn't understand that concept. There are countries that, you know, people get a year off with pay to take care of their newborns, and, you know, everybody gets a doula, and, you know. Huh? Civilized. Civilized countries, <laughs> yeah. But, but here, we tend to, um, Give kudos to the, to the person who's running around Lake Merritt with a stroller, her $800 stroller, at two weeks. You know, those are the people that we think are really cool. And that's not what you're supposed to be doing. It makes me insane when I'm in Target and I hear this, ah! I mean, you know that this baby is hardly illegal. Why is it in Target? You know, and I just want to go over and say, why are either of you in Target? Go home. You know, and I did say that once to one of the L and D nurses who was on her way to time. I said, Didn't you just have a baby? She goes, Well, yeah, but I wanted to get a fourth of July off and I said, Well you go home and you're <laughs> <laughs> <Get away. laughs> She still laughs at me real but she's easy with that. But um yeah, I think that's the biggest thing, is the isolation of and the other thing is that I also don't. Learn, I, I I've always said since I started doing this that there should be a, a postpartum specialty for for people who have babies because once they have the baby they're pretty much on their own. You know the obstetrician's done because that their job is to get your baby out. Um, if they do GYN they just go well it's probably because you were pregnant <laughs> and then 
the pediatrician has no clue, and he's there for the baby. So, and they don't get seen for like six weeks after they've had this baby. Do you know what can happen to someone in six weeks who doesn't know anything about what should happen to them or what should be, what's right or what's, and that's why, I think that's why so many um, low-income women die um, in, in postpartum because they aren't really, they aren't told well what to do and what to look for. They don't know um, what too much bleeding is. They don't know um, anything really. They just sent home with a baby and said, come back in six weeks and see us, you know, if you're still alive and <laughs> I was bled out or had a stroke. You know, so um, I think that's a problem. And I, and I don't know how to address it, but I think I think people are becoming more and more aware that postpartum is a, a, a more important time of the birth journey than it has been in the past. Or, or women who have to go back to work right away. Yeah, that's the other thing. You know, we, we don't get the concept of you need a year to heal up and get your life back together, your body back together before you're ready. And I, I would, I would, I work with these women postpartum, and when I used to, when I did more day work, and it would be like three or four weeks out, and someone from their office would call them to ask them a question, and I'm like, five minutes ago, this woman didn't know why she went to the kitchen. Why are you asking her? Why are you calling her to make a decision about your business? You don't want to be asking her anything. She's like, no. She's got a postpartum brain. She has no clue. You know, so if you really knew, you wouldn't be asking her, you know, to, to make some decision about your business. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are people who have to go back six weeks after they have the baby, which I think is just criminal. Really criminal. I think three months is criminal, but six weeks, for sure, is just really bad and, and most low income people can't keep their job for three months. They have to get back to work if they want to keep their job. Yeah. I think my follow up question is do you have suggestions for the women about kind of preventing that isolation and dealing with it or Yeah, I try to suggest that they all get into some kind of mom support group if they can. There's several around the area. Or just, you know, I, I tell them the reason you go into a childbirth class is yeah, you go to learn about what's going to happen, but you really go to find new friends, mm -hmm. because once you have a baby, your old friends, you got to get new ones. The, the ones that are single think you've lost your mind because all you're talking about is poop and breast milk. And the ones who have kids, they don't want to come back here. You know, they'll catch up with you later when the kids are like three or four, but they don't want to come back. They'll, be, they'll give you some food, but they don't want to be immersed in that. Um, so you have to find people, new people who are going along the same track as you are, you know, and that's how you build your community around having a baby. You go to, the, and the, you don't have to like everybody in the class, just find two or three people that you can, you know, relate to. Yeah. You mentioned hormone depletion after you mm -hmm. birth. Mm -hmm. Is there like a standard amount of time that it takes for the new spaces to happen, or? To get back to normal. Is it different for everybody? Yeah, yeah I think it's huh? different for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think one of the biggest issues with is nutrition. Yeah. Women who have a good nutritional base recover better from everything, from surgery, from mm -hmm. delivery, from breastfeeding, mm -hmm. than women who are not getting Who live in a food desert. Yeah. Food desert. Yeah. 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 The, the standard answer is around, you're welcome, the standard answer is around six weeks, but, you know, I think they run drag that out a little bit longer now because they realize that that's not a good thing. Um, and we haven't touched on postpartum depression or postpartum psychosis, but that's on the rise also. And I think that has a lot to do with, you know, the way that people birth and the trauma that they've gone through and, uh, and the isolation and um, no support. And that can, that can drag you down really quickly. And, it's hard to it's hard to see. I've worked with people who've had it before, and luckily the ones I've worked with had people around them that got them help fairly quickly. But um, I, I watched a movie once that was about postpartum psychosis, and it's just really sad because these people don't necessarily. They some of them are kind of functional. If it's really bad, you're just not functional. You're just kind of comatose. But if you're kind of functioning, but have this deep depression, um, 
people think you're okay. And, and we as women have a way of letting people think we're okay when we're not. And then the next thing you know, they're in the news because they've driven their kids into the lake or you know, burn the house down or drown them all. And then they become this horrible person. When if someone had just paid attention or if she'd seen a doctor before six weeks that might have picked up on this, then these things might not have happened. Or if you had a postpartum doula. Or if you had a postpartum doula that might have been there to see what's going on. Yeah. If, if I may comment on that too, uh, is, I think that that's one area that traditional um, medical care to pregnant women and women who give it birth really falls flat on its face. That is screening women um, for doing a risk assessment for postpartum depression and postpartum um, psychosis. You know, when as nurses in the hospital, we get somebody's prenatal records, and it is so frequent that, they, that there is nothing written about a woman's mental health. And so the very first thing you look at to assess whether or not somebody's at risk is there has to be a, a, a pre-delivery assessment done. And that is probably the most frequent thing that is totally left blank. Yeah. It makes me crazy. And I, and I think a big part of that is, is what I tell my clients is when, they, when, they're, when they've gone through this whole Yelp thing and ask everybody and pick the perfect doctor for them, which they won't have when they deliver. Um, whoever that person is, when you're in the hospital delivering, I think it's more about the baby because the oxygen job is to get that baby out of you breathing. So who cares what shape you were in? We're just trying to get the baby out of the pod, you know. So it's not. It's like, it's kind of like what's going on in the news right now. They don't really care. I don't think about where you were or where you're coming from because if they did, those questions would be on a form somewhere, and it's not. It's just it's like, you know, it's like, well, when did you get pregnant? And then that's about it. Sometimes they'll ask you what you're eating, you know, but even that gets lost, especially if you're low income. You know, it's also, just, you're that bad. Well, yeah, then there's that. Well, then you're always eating the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more about culturally specific resources? Mm -hmm. um, for people who are planning on giving birth. And I also think around the burden um, of people of color who really want to serve communities of color but not actually being able to sustain, yeah. like, to do the work. So can you talk a little bit more about that as well? It's, um, as far as the resources to find birth workers of color, it's hard. It's hard. There are a lot of us. They're, they're, they're beginning to get more. And the good thing is that people of color understand that we're here now. For the most part of the years that I worked, I would, what is that? You know, they, we don't know. In the community, we don't know about it. You know, you can go right now to East Oakland and walk up another street and ask 10 people. No one there will know what a doula is. They just, nobody tells them. You know, the doctors and the clinics and stuff know. Some of the clinics will tell it because they're working with doulas, but for the most part they're not told about midwives and doulas. Um, so it's, it's a hard kind of way to do it. There, there are going to be more and more uh, like websites where you can go and people have registered on there and you can find them that way or word of mouth. Um, as far as training to be a doula, there, there are more and more um, organizations that are women of color who are training women of color. Um, one of the ones I'm involved with is called Roots of Labor, Birth Collective. Um, they're here in the East Bay, and they're all women of color who are training women of color. We're having a training this week, as a matter of fact, for fall week training. And we have like 30 people signed up for this training, which is amazing. You know, I'm so happy. But um, it's still very few and far between. There, there's When I started doing this work, there might have been maybe two pages of doulas that you could pick from, more like one and a half pages. <laughs> and now there's like a phone book. Remember, I don't know if anybody knows what phone book is. <laughs> <laughs> the contacts in your phone. Um, that many people are, are, are becoming doulas because it's, um, for many it's a stepping stone to, to being 
going into midwifery. Um, I see it as a standalone career. I've never, ever, 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 ever wanted to be a midwife. Um, I think that's something that you're called to do, and I never, nobody ever. <laughs> I, I said I don't, you know, I want, I don't want to be responsible for anybody's life. I, I just want to be there to help support, get them through that part, and get them started well. I don't want to, um, to be responsible for them staying alive and sewing up their yanni. I don't want to do that. So, um, but a lot of people see, think that if you, you can become a doula for first, and then learn more about birth, and then move on to being a midwife. Um, so it's it's getting better, but it's 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 a, we got a long way to go. We have a long way to go, especially with midwives, you know, um, because that's a long, arduous process to become a midwife. Whether you become a midwife through just following a midwife around doing home births, or if you go to medical school and, and midwifery school, it's a long process. And um, the schools that have court have, you know. Um, a midwifery program, they don't seem to be able to find black people to ask if they'd like to be in the program. Because <laughs> it's hard to find black people. So um, that's a big problem. You know, it's like a, they, they say that they understand that there's a problem, that they don't have enough black midwives in the program, but then when they're presented with them, they're like, well, no, we're not going to mm -hmm. take them. We're going to mm -hmm. go this route. And sometimes they have to be made to take these people who are just as qualified, but for some reason they can't quite see that. So, um, so that's the part that's being worked on, I think, more and more, that we're trying to get um, more with more, more with life change, color. Yeah. And where would these training programs be? Some of the big schools have UCSF has one, um, Yale has one. Um, there's some programs that you can go and just it's kind of an immersive where they go to Texas or Jamaica or someplace and then we're you know, looking at lots of babies and then they get trained that way. Yeah. Hi. My question is regarding um, taking care of a partner. Uh -huh. What do you tell the partner how to take care of him or herself uh -huh. um, before and after the birth and how to take care of each other? When are they ready to hear that and how does that look like? And ideally, in a perfect world, how can families support them during the first six weeks? Um, what I tell them is to get as much rest as they possibly can right now. <laughs> because rest is gone once the baby's there. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand. I don't think that they hear it, but they don't hear it. It's like, like I said before, postpartum is a thing that nobody, they can't quite get their mind wrapped around it. I used to teach a... Um, like a baby care thing, how to put on a diaper kind of class, you know. And I would always try to sneak in postpartum, and they would just glaze over because they're too intent on how am I going to get that thing out of there. It just doesn't <laughs> compute to them. And their whole focus is on how is that ever going to happen. So they don't hear when I would try to say, you know, you've got to get your rest because sleep when the baby sleeps. Um, the partner has to do their share. And it's not all on one person. It has to be kind of shared duties. And I said, you know, you probably won't even get a shower for a couple of days. And they're going to be like, I've lost my mind. And then I talk to them about how, well, you're going to wake up and you're going to feed the baby. And then the baby's going to sleep for two hours. You may get breakfast at that point. And then it's time to feed the baby again. And now it's four in the afternoon and you haven't taken, you haven't got dressed. Let's let's take a shower. So they, they don't they can't hear that though. They can't hear it until afterwards. And then when they do have the baby and they say, oh well, they, and they say to their friends, you know, I, I had these night my I've been stretched all night. I was, I was, I'm just sweat is all over. And they go, Oh yeah, 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 that that happens. <laughs> well, why didn't you tell me? And they go, Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, they don't tell them the things that are gonna happen until the part of they just you know, they, they, they can't, first of all, they can't hear it. Second of all, nobody tells them. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing phenomenon. <laughs> so. Yeah, what I tell the moms is eat when the baby eats, sleep when the baby sleeps, do laundry when the baby does laundry. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how people can support. I, I try to tell them that. You know, people think that I have bringing a new baby home is like this big social, familial time. It's not. 
it's a time for, for the three or four of them to just be together and learn each other and learn how to feed your baby. Stay in bed and feed your baby. I tell them if somebody comes to the door, even if you have all your clothes on, put a bathrobe on before you open the door. Because if somebody sees you in a bathrobe at 3 in the afternoon, they're not going to hang out because they think, oh, <laughs> that's bad. So they won't stay around. But if you go to the door all made up and everything, they're going to think it's the time to come in and hang out, and you don't need that. Um, and I tell them that unless someone's going to come in and clean your toilet, they don't need to be there. You know, The grandparents can come and see the baby, and if they're going to cook or hold the baby or do something productive, then they can wait for three weeks to come too. You know, it's, it's, it's people only that can help you. You know, if they're not going to help you, then they don't get to come. I said, you know, make a food, have one of your friends make a food tree for you so you don't have to worry about cooking. And when they bring that food, they don't get to come and see the baby because the baby's going to look the same to them in a month as it does right now. They don't look different. So they get to give you food and go away. That's you know, you, you don't bring people in and have this party atmosphere because you're not up to it and your partner's not up to it and people feel like if people come into their home, they have to entertain them and there's no, there's no shape to do that. Yeah. And what people can do beforehand, I always tell them, they, they're like, oh, I wish I could have a postpartum going. I say, you know, all that crap that people are going to bring in the baby shower, Tell them to leave in the store and make them fun, pay for your sanity after you have a baby by having a postpartum doula come in. You know, do that. Don't don't give people the little pink dress. Give them the thirty dollars that you would have paid for the little pink dress to go toward having someone. That that pays for an hour or so of someone coming in to help them. And and, and it's a really good thing to do um, for people. If you, if you have a friend that's gonna have a baby, you know, start a fund for them to pay for help because they need it, no matter who they are. Yes? Earlier you said a term that I didn't understand. I think it might have been night uh -huh. Or is that in my notes? Yes. You're <laughs> I can't, but uh, a night doula is a night postpartum doula. And postpartum doulas come in a couple of shapes. They either do just go in the daytime and help people, which looks more like helping and education, you know, it's like, okay, this is how you do this. This is how you might want to do this. Watch me do this. Let me let me see you breastfeed. Let me help you with that. Where people who do night postpartum, generally the people are asleep. So they're, then our job is just to take care of the baby during the nighttime. So we, are, we aren't washing clothes or, you know, I might fold a few, but I ain't washing me. But you know, in the daytime, you do more things to help them. Like you might do baby's laundry or... Uh, you might run to the store or whatever that they might need. But at night, it's, it's people just want you there to take over so they can sleep. And then, you know, sometimes the, the mom will get come out to breastfeed. But they, if I'm there for any length of time, and I, like I said, I usually work with twins, so they figure it out really quick. And they figure out that they can pump and just give me a bottle and see me in the morning. <laughs> so that's what they end up doing. They may, they may come out for the first week or so, but then it's like, yeah, no. to tell a new doulas to be more like I am now <laughs> because new doulas are very cute they're very excited so when someone calls and says I'm in labor they're like oh, oh, and they run and they do all this stuff and they get to the people and then they're there for like they have to leave because now they're there a week before the baby comes, you know, it's like, um, so it's, it's to, to try to figure out, to understand that birth is a long process usually. There are those rare people who have their baby in three hours, but that's not the norm. The, the average first time birth is somewhere what, between 24 and 36 hours. You know, it's a long time. Um, and so to pace themselves and to take care of themselves. I remember when I first started out, 
I would go to a birth and I wouldn't take any food, you know, I wouldn't take a blanket, I would, you know, I would be hungry, I didn't have any water, you know, I would be just there and I would never sleep. And I'm like, this is insane. <laughs> but now, because I'm old, I say, okay, this is how it's gonna go. <laughs> and I explain to them because they're not hiring me to be ever present with them. You know, that's not the kind of doula I am. If they want that kind of doula, they're gonna buy a 20 year old one because I can't do that anymore. Um, they're hiring me from my experience and my knowledge. And so I do tell them that, you know, at the beginning, I'm not gonna be, I'm gonna be sitting here watching you guys. And if I need to interject something, then I will. But my time is spent for, like I said, when she gets to that place where um, the partner, she doesn't want the, anywhere to stay to do with the partner anymore. <laughs> she has to have a female there with her. Um, and I bring food for myself, or I will go and get food. You know, that's the only time I leave them, so I go downstairs and get a sandwich or something. Um, and I tell them, that if you do happen to get an epidural, we're all going to sleep. And hopefully I won't snore too much to bother you. <laughs> but we're all going to go to sleep. I want you especially to go to sleep. And the partner needs to go to sleep. And I'm going to go to sleep. Because we have to work when it comes time to being able to help you push your baby up. Because you can't feel now. And you're going to need some coaching to do that. So, um, so yeah. I would tell them to, to invest, in, invest in some self-care because we tend to not do that for many reasons. Do you carry a doula bag? No. I'm not a doula bag kind of girl. So. <laughs> <laughs> I never have been one. I, I always thought that, I, you know, I do live my life always on call, but I don't want to have to be looking for that bag if I'm somewhere else. No, I don't carry a bag. Um, I remember, I don't know, about 18 years ago or so, the, the monthly little magazine they show at people's door did a story on me and another doula, this white doula, and we we're both the same age, and they said, they asked me what I carried in my bag, because they'd already talked to her, and I said, I, I don't have a bag, and they'd go, but, but Carol said that she has this. I said, well, that's Carol. <laughs> I don't have time to have all that crap in the bag. I, have, I, have, I said, I can find whatever I need at the hospital. I can. I don't need to have any of that stuff. And, 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 uh, and I laugh because I work with all these, um, these young women of color who are all very spiritual, what I call woo-woo. <laughs> and uh, they laugh at me because they're, they're all into their thing. And I'm in. Some of it's really good. I said, but it's just, I, I can't, it's laughable for me to do that. I, if I was to do that somewhere, they would just like, what are you doing? So, um, so it's, everybody does it their own way. It's just, I'm not that kind of person. I'm very, what you see is what you get, and this is me, you know. So I just bring me, and um, hopefully that's enough. Yeah, yeah. How have you seen birth practices change over your years as a doula? I wish I could say they were getting better, but they're not. I think it's, um, there are more and more interventions than it used to be. Um, I don't know, maybe you two labor delivery people can talk to it, but I, I just see it as, you know, all these, you know, every other week there's a study about how to have your baby, or why you should have your baby earlier, and um, why you should do this, and why you should not do that, and, you know, I just keep thinking that, you know, birth isn't something that we just discovered a couple of years ago, or even a hundred years ago. People have been having babies for a really long time, and everybody did not die, or there wouldn't be all those people out 80 right now. Um, but, but it's just, they want to really make it a science and more medical than it, it is. I think that birth is, is nature, it's not science. You know? And the system is so amazing and so perfect, mm -hmm. if left alone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to just watch a woman have her baby, there's nothing more beautiful. You know, there's just nothing more beautiful in my estimation. But to see what they do to them when they go into the hospital and they have, I mean, there's stuff coming out of every orifice of their body. And it's just like, I don't understand that. I don't understand how we, how we, how have we gotten to this, to just have a baby. It's not. You know, girls have them at the prom in the bathroom. We have them in taxi cabs and elevators. And yes, I know that there are some that are high risk pregnancies that have to be, you know, monitored and maintained, but we shouldn't treat everybody like those few people.
But it's what we tend to do. We treat, we treat everybody like they're high risk, and they're not. And then and the ones that are not, we make them high risk if they're not already. And to say that a woman today that's 37 year old is a geriatric person, that's just wrong. Because now you've told her she's so old at 37, there's just no way she can get a baby out of her body. You're geriatric, you know? And just the terms they use, you right. know? Um, oh my God. They did, they, they used to call it a, a feedback, which is a vaginal birth after a C section. Now it's called a TOLAC, a trial of labor after a C section. Mm -hmm. So we know you probably, you can try, mm -hmm. but you probably won't do it. <laughs> you know, it's just all these terms that. You know, or they'll come and say to, to people, well, you know, your uterus is just getting so tired. It's just failed you. I'm mm. like, uh, her uterus didn't fail her. <laughs> you did that to her uterus. <laughs> her uterus was just fine when we gave her hair. <laughs> you, know, so, you know, it's just, it's that kind of stuff yes. that's just kind of can make you crazy, right. you know. Yeah. And, and right now, for black women and birth, Serena Williams is our poster child because um, she's proof that they don't listen to black women when we tell them about, we, we've been with this body for however many years we've had it, so we kind of know it. And she knows, she knew her body. And, and I say if she was any other black woman, she'd be dead right now. And the only reason she isn't is because she, she made them listen to what was wrong with her, how to fix, how to find it, and how to fix it. And she had to fight to make them do that. And she's Serena Williams. And I'm like, and the other thing is I, I watched her, part of her special, and she was going home after having the baby, and she said, made me almost cry. I'm going to cry. She said, she said, you know, I didn't want to have a, a C-section because they knew that it would be dangerous, that she would run the risk of throwing a blood clot if she had a C-section. So I knew I, I didn't want one, but you know, I, I never really thought I could push a baby out. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, this is the strongest woman on the planet, and she didn't think she could push out a six pound baby. Mm -hmm. Who told her that? Mm -hmm. Who told her that? That this is what she's held in her mind. And we do that to women, you know. Mm -hmm. I had a client one time that said, oh yeah, I went to a chiropractor when I was 17. He told me that I probably wouldn't be able to push out a baby. What? <laughs> what is that? And so she's held on to that, mm -hmm. you know. She believes that, you know. We can't do that to women. Mm -hmm. We have to let them know that they're powerful and, and keep them empowered. And, and going to the hospital is probably the most disempowering thing that can happen when you're giving birth. It's just so sad. Um, but we keep doing it, and we just have to keep educating people that there's a better way. And if they, if they can't afford to do the better way or if they're too afraid to do the better way, then teach them how to go into the hospital and have a baby. And don't just go in there like a lamb to slaughter. Mm -hmm. that, that they know that they have rights, that they have. They can ask questions, they have to get answers to them. People can't just do things to them. They can't just walk in and put their hand in them without they're doing it themselves. You know, things like that, which seems very weird, but that's what happens. You know, um, they, ha they have to be educated on how to go to the hospital and have a baby. Yeah. So, um, I totally agree with you. It's just getting further and further removed sort of from this natural process that yeah. we've been doing since the beginning of time. Yeah. And I wonder, I recently thought that part of it has to do with the fact that we've totally forgotten that we're mammals. <laughs> and that most mammals need to find a quiet, safe place yeah. to give birth. Exactly. And I grew up partially on a farm. And so oftentimes, like I can't even believe that there are terms for all these procedures that, that we sometimes assist with, that all it involves is, is just gently Time. guiding. Time. Yeah, and now right. you know we have to have these classes and the ultrasound to figure out exactly which way the baby's turning. It's like, you don't need that no, stuff. Babies know how to turn. <laughs> they know how to turn, and we just if we can just spend half as much energy on helping people realize how strong they are. Yeah. And instead of telling and, them how they can do it. And to just be in their bodies more than being mm -hmm. cerebral about yeah. the whole process. Yeah. And I think the more we sort of make procedures and come up with new names for all these things that we think we need to do, um, the more scary it is 
for the entire birthing family. Exactly. And um, and because you're like losing control, you don't even know what these terms mean. I don't know what these terms mean. And I've been doing this for thirty five years. Yeah. And and they come up with new terms every other day. Yeah. Well, it's, it's I think it's a control thing, mm-hmm. the power and control mm-hmm. thing. And if we can do all these magical, we have all these acronyms and all this stuff, and and scare people. Like right now, my niece is in the hospital because her due date was yesterday. I think she's like two weeks overdue. And they, she said, well, they told me I have to go because of my age. And then it's more likely that I'll have a stillborn baby if I wait. And I'm just like, ugh. You know, and you can't, it's hard for me to fight that because I'm not the doctor. You know, and that she may trust me, but she trusts those people in the building better. You know, and they're, and they're, these are the people who are supposed to be taking care of her, and they're telling her if she stays home for a week, she'll probably have a dead child. So she's going to go spend a week in the hospital. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, that didn't sound good. Um, so. So you have that to deal with, and it's 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 all about fear-based things. You know, it's just it's it's really sad that they control people with fear when they're giving having their babies. So, but it works. Because <laughs> yeah. once you say to somebody, "Well, you can do that," but you know, we had people do that before, and they came back with a dead baby. Where are you going? Right. You're not going home. You're not going home. So you stay and you do all the things that they tell you to do. Four days. <laughs> to be in the for four days and you sit there at home or in a spa. Right. <laughs> you know, so. But until, you know, until we get enough people walking in the streets saying, I'm not going to have my baby that way, that's what we're going to have because, um, you know, I'm on, I'm on all these things that are trying to fix the system, but it's up to you and you and you, all you young women who are about to have babies or may someday have babies to say, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing it that way, you know, to make this stop. I don't see any other way, any other way for it to stop because it's a, it's a really good money maker, this birth thing, you know. Mm-hmm. So if they can bring you in there and use all the stuff that they have, I call, I, sometimes <laughs> I'm there and I'm like, Oh yeah, you got the elder base tree of life going on. You know, it's like <laughs> this six yeah. elder base what? tree of life. You got six pumps going in. You got wires, <laughs> tubes going in every part of your body, and you know, and a blood pressure cuff and, a, and all this stuff. You know, and she's just laying there like, you know, like poor thing. And I just go, you know, puppies can go into the closet mm-hmm. by themselves mm-hmm. whenever they feel like it and come out with seven babies. How come we can't as a this higher level mammal go someplace and have one. I don't understand why we can't do that. But according to the doctors, we can't. Because there's no money in that. No, there's not a bit of money in going in the closet. No. But there's a lot of money in going to the hospital and getting all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Anything else? It's not all bad. <laughs> it's not all bad, and it's not that everybody's dying in the hospital. But um, I just I want if, when I go and do these things, I just feel like if one person in the room goes to have their baby and says no, I won't do that, or you have to say if I'm talking to medical students, if one of them hears me say introduce yourself before you put your hand in her. I feel like my job is done, you know, because you can't fix it all. But if you can just fix a little bit, and if all of you can go out and talk to your friends about what doulas are, what midwives are, that they have an option, that they can have their babies at home. It's not dangerous. It's not horrible. If you're a healthy woman or person giving birth, you can have a baby at home. You know, it's it's probably the safest place for you to be because when you go in the hospital, they make you have a C-section. It's not like, you know, you went in there and then all of a sudden, this is what happened. I just I was with this couple a couple weeks ago and the, the father just 
lost it because of what she was, this is like the fourth day of an induction and he said, just two o'clock in the morning, they put all the lights on to tell her that they want to do this procedure while well, everybody in the room's asleep. They wake her up, he's asleep, I'm asleep, and then they start talking to her. And he, I woke him up and he's like, what's going on? And he said, oh, well, we want to do this procedure. And he's like, and why didn't you wake me up to tell me that? Why are you here at 2 o'clock in the morning? You couldn't wait till 6 to tell us this stuff. And then they come up with some reason why. And he just, he lost it. He said, you know, you guys have been lying to us from the time we walked in. You told us this infection would take a day. We're here four days. We still have a baby. Um, all the, he said her, her blood pressure was so high, she was going to stroke out. Nobody's giving her any medicine or taking her blood pressure in three days. You know, it's like all this stuff. And he said, look at my wife. She was a strong, empowered woman four days ago. Look what you did. <laughs> I'm like, yes. You know, but, but then everybody was really nice to them after that. <laughs> but it, it shouldn't have to take that to, to just go and have a, a good birth. It shouldn't take that. So, so if you all go out and tell everybody what wonderful people do us are, like, y'all have to have one. And, yeah. Then you have options. And to ask questions of your practitioner. Mm -hmm. Don't just do what they say and take it for granted. Make them explain why they want to do stuff to you. Make them explain why you have to come have your baby at 39 weeks. They'll scare you enough to tell you that, yeah, you should, but at least have them tell you. Don't just take it at face value. Because I, I, I talk to people, they say, well, yeah, well, our doctor said I had to have it at 39 weeks. Why? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's just what they told me. Yeah. So have them tell you why. Thank yeah. you so much. My parents transition into families. Um, she is a birth and postpartum professional that has supported over a hundred women during birth um, and.